The following program does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Reality Radio 101, its advertisers and sponsors, or its listening audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, where mind, mood, and what matters to you are discussed. We're broadcasting live from Toronto, Ontario, Canada on Reality Radio 101. Get ready to talk, email, or post a message to us. We are looking forward to speaking with you. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now, your host of the Bear Psychology Radio Show, Dr. Anna Baranowski. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be back with you today, bearing witness to evolving mood, mind, Health. This is conversations about trauma recovery, relationships, work, and life adventures, and I'm so happy to speak with you. If you have any comments or questions or something that you want to ask, please do feel free to email us at instudio101 at gmail.com. We have a very interesting uh, guest today, uh, Dr. John King, and he's going to talk about his book, uh, the recent documentaries he was featured in, and, you know, really, I think, kind of the topic of today, which is like, oh my goodness, we all just got over the holiday season, and uh, how did that work out for you? So holidays can whip us up into a tense frenzy, sucking all the joy out of life. Have you experienced this? A lot of people, you know, their first thought is, thank goodness it's over. (laughs) And, uh, you know, that kind of comes up pretty powerfully for a lot of people. Yesterday, I was um, just driving home uh, from uh, an evening with a with a friend, and and she just honestly told me that you know she didn't even really want to get out of bed. She was kind of feeling a little bit um, overwrought by the demands of the season, and you know, for some people, they they kind of are stuck with a feeling like they wish that it, it was over already, even before it starts. And when we dig just a little deeper. Many of these thoughts, they really stem from, you know, a kind of aching feeling of loneliness, maybe regrets or depression or fear or even the anxiety and trepidation of being with family or maybe in uncertain social situations, especially if we've we've experienced, you know, difficulty and, you know, maybe our lives were not that good. Maybe it was tough growing up in the family that we grew up with and, you know, then, feeling uncertain in social situations would be a kind of a normal response, especially, you know, according to um, attachment theory, which teaches us a whole lot about, you know, how we are shaped by our earliest life experiences. So whether it's about being alone or not being alone, um, these things seem to be the greatest source of distress when we really peel back all the layers. It's not so much about the gifts we may or may not have gotten, but, you know, deeply, deeply with inside of ourselves, how are we sitting? What's our relationship to ourselves? You know, I wonder what your experience has been this year. Maybe you felt too alone or maybe the opposite. You were distressed by being in a social setting. Well, today shows a chance for us to contemplate what happened, what we learned, and maybe what we want to work on deeply with inside of ourselves. You know, because often it's the worst times that point us in direction of where we really have to grow. So if we use that as a starting point, I could ask you, what were the worst times of the season and what does that point out to you as your place to grow in 2019? And, you know, I think that it it can be a really important thing for us to consider 
because really, uh, as you know, I've said this before, I believe that we have a responsibility to grow and evolve to be the people that we're meant to be in this life. So, as I said, we have um, Dr. John King as our guest today. He's an author and a deep diver into what it really means to deal with and survive the most treacherous of family environments. Um, I I think that kind of captures it correctly, doesn't it, um, Dr. John? Yes, it sure does. It sure does, yeah. So I'm not sure that the people who are listening today really uh, know who you are um, or, you know, what your background is. I know that you have um, a Ph.D. in theology that you completed um, about 12 years ago and that you're originally from Australia, but now you're living in Texas. And you told me it's 60 degrees there today, so uh, it's not 60 degrees here today. It's quite cold. Um I wonder, you know, if you'd mind, I'd like to start with um, just reading a poem um, in your chapter from your book, Um, and it was a chapter titled Never a Victim, and um, if it's okay, I'm going to read that. Is that all right? It's from your book, uh, Hashtag Deal With It, Living Well with PTSD, and in the poem you say, I am many things imperfect, a work in progress, a man trying to own his crap, but I have never been a victim, be it of sexual abuse or anything else. A victim has already lost their battle. I have just begun to fight. So I want to start with that because it's, uh, I think it's a good start for um, the reality that we've all just gotten through the holiday season and You know, for some people, they've faced families or maybe they've faced isolation by choice because those they called their family were actually toxic, dangerous, and maybe the greatest source of threat in life. And I think that was probably true for you. And I wonder if you could just um, comment on the poem and and what inspired you to write that. Um, So to give a little context, I had recall of sexual abuse um, I was 45, I blocked it all out, and I had recall of abuse that happened from the age of 4 to 16 um, by my parents and their friends, you know, some, we would call some of that trafficking uh, today. Mm-hmm. So w- with this recall, I had onset of complex post-traumatic stress um, that was combated by um, borderline and personality disorder. So all this sort of stuff turned up, and I started to dig into it and and try and find, get the resources and try and map a way through it. And it was very difficult because I was male. Um, there's a a consensus that men don't who aren't sexually abused, or well, there was at the time, you know, ten years ago. So there was no books, there were no support groups, there was no one willing to have conversations with me about it. And I just, I, I suppose when I, when I started to read, I started to read on social media, um, you know, the web, all that sort of stuff. And I found a whole lot of people that were sitting around bemoaning the fact that life was not perfect for them. And I thought, well, that's BS. I said, I'm not going to buy into whatever that is. I don't know what that is. I've, you know, I'm, that's not the sort of person I am. And I, I couldn't see it being helpful. Um, there were times I felt very down. There was times I was very despondent, particularly as I got sicker in a sense you know as as the full ramifications of what had happened to me kicked in but I could never settle with a sense of um, victimhood and I I never wanted to buy into that narrative because I couldn't see it helpful in people you know I'd read stories and talk to people who would talk about you know they were were abused 20 30 years ago and they were still um, camped there that there was no moving forward for them. And, and I thought, well, you know, that's not, that's just, that's not healthy. It means your life is over before it's begun and and you, you weren't responsible for this. So why give them that much power? So out of that came, you know, I penned a lot of poetry at the time. My first book was called No Working Title, A Life in Progress, um, The Effects of Sexual Abuse and Pornography on Men. Um, and that was one of the poems in that. 
Wow, very it's very profound. It's very beautiful that you could see that this whole idea that, you know, your your life was not supposed to be over. That, you know, you were more than just your story. But you know, what I was just struck by and something I've heard from many people is that You know, it wasn't until you were much older, many years after all this trauma and abuse, that these stories came flooding in. And, um, you know, from reading your book, I, I, I understand that you had this terrible family history, but then, you know, when you had all this old, um, storyline pouring in, you lost your marriage, your relationship with your kids, uh, the the work that you were doing, you had to stop it. Like, you know, it, it must have been horrific to face that level of um, emotional pain and suffering really alone. Yeah, I was. I lost everything. Um, the businesses, the, the church that I was running at the time, I had a very um, successful corporate coaching and corporate training business. I was traveling about 150, 200,000 air miles a year and uh, I went from that to uh, an inability to sit in peak hour traffic on the freeway. You know, I was overcome with panic and fear um, and a chronic stutter. Did you, did you feel that before this um, pivotal change was inside of you at age 45 that really that things were okay or you know were you masking it did you have any awareness of something peeking through or a sense of panic or i mean what was happening to cover that all over um it's a gross analogy but it's a little bit like a an infection beneath the skin uh you know things were building like years ago probably 20 years ago the the extreme emotional reactions, the zero to a hundred, the the panics and all that might happen once a quarter. Maybe ten years ago, it was once every two or th- two months or so. Then it became once a month, once a week, then two or three times a day. So things were building, and there was no. I, I couldn't identify a cause for it, and it was literally like you know the brain. Um, so recall, particularly in men of sexual abuse, on average happens if it's been repressed between the ages of 35 and 45, and it comes back. Uh, so, which is you know pretty much in the in the bell curve there. So when it came back beforehand, it was like little snippets of eight millimeter film. And what happened on this particular, uh, I believe it was a Thursday, was that it all strung together and played for the first time. And I, so any of those frames, you would look at them and talk about them and think, well, that, that's not right. That doesn't sound right that that happened. I, man, that's a bit odd to have that as a memory. But there was no context to it. There was no stringing it together. And what happened with the recall is it all just strung together. And mm-hmm. I remember saying for the first time, wow, I've, I've been sexually abused. Mm-hmm. Right. It just really... Um, the the, the storyline started to play through in a cogent way, so it was undeniable. Was something happening in your life at age 45 that uh, either allowed you to um, have the uh, willingness to look at this content or something that was occurring that forced you to kind of reflect in a, a way that you hadn't previously? No, it was um, it was a tsunami. It was uh, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and I remember one, when I was a kid, um, I used to walk to school, particularly after a, a, a bad weekend or series of events. And there was a lady, and she always used to pl- um, plant daffodils. Mm-hmm. And these daffodils would grow, and they would. I would look forward to those daffodils every year as a child because it meant I made it through another year. And they were so beautiful and yellow and they smelled so nice. And so I planted some daffodils around um, a little cabin where I used to write my books and do my work. And uh, I remember this one particular day, just the last thing I remember before the recall was looking at these things and saying, aren't they beautiful daffodils this year? And it just set off the, uh, the flood. And it started and it didn't stop for probably five years. 
I find that actually really interesting because I I have heard from quite a few people that it's actually in the times of soft reflection that the most powerful memories can spring forth. It's it's almost like we have to create a little stability in order for us to to face our own truth. Um, otherwise, we're kind of in a state of fight or flight, or just kind of keeping our life together. Uh, and um, you know, it's that you know those years where you're building the foundation of your life, and you're working really hard, and you're putting your relationships together, and you know, it's that building phase that for a lot of people. Nothing gets through because you're so hyper-focused on and you have so much energy for, you know, just pushing your life forward. You know, at 45, it sounds like you had established enough that you were able to kind of look at those daffodils and just take them in for a moment. Um, I wonder how that strikes you when you hear that. Uh I, I understand what you're saying, and I can I, I can connect with that. Um, I, I I think also the brain gets to a point where it, it just has to deal with things. It just it's like cognitively you come to a point where like, the, the the frantic activity of the leading up to then a lot of a lot of those times we we tell ourselves we are striving to achieve and place ourselves for our latter half. I I think really what we're doing is as you alluded to, we're masking things that we haven't dealt with because we don't know how to deal with them. And within my context, it was just everything that I'd gone through was just my normality. It was, it never struck me as being abuse. It never struck me as being abnormal because it was my only reality, it was the only childhood I had. So yeah. it, it wasn't, it wasn't a uh, so much the soft reflection, I think, as. I feel like because of the change that happens in the brain and the, and the change that happened going forward, it was like my brain was saying, "You are, I'm going to force you to deal with this for your own health going forward. And it's like the body's, you know, expelled this, this, this garbage. And it was like you spend the next period of time trying to you know, scrape it up and deal, deal with it, face it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I want to go back to the topic of um, being with families, let's say, or being with people over the holidays or not being with people over the holidays. And I want to actually reference the incomparable Russell Brand, who's a comedian and an actor. And he, he gave this, um, he popped out this little quick YouTube video on reflections of preparing for the holidays. And, you know, he... I think it's worth listening to, but it's interesting. He does cover some important things like, you know, if you're going to spend time with people, especially if things have been really difficult, um, you know, look towards what you have in common, try to understand more than being understood, try to comfort more than be comforted. Don't look to feel better, but instead, you know, what is it you could do for other people? You know, and he, he really kind of appeal to the reality that there are a lot of people who are lonely and suffering and, you know, how important it is to maybe reach out to somebody who might be suffering as well, to be understanding and tender towards other people, you know, and then, you know, he, he ends with this idea that if we can't get along with each other, then how possibly could we hope for a larger peaceful world? And I listened to that little YouTube video and, you know, I knew we had our upcoming conversation and it it i was just left with this uh, this notion that that's fine that's great you know that we can do all these lovely wonderful understanding things for other people but what if you're with a family or isolated by choice because you know your family was so incredibly toxic dangerous and as i had mentioned before just this you know that they may have been the most dangerous people in your life and um, I had asked you before, actually, you asked me before we went live how my holidays were. And I said they were fine. Actually, they were lovely. And I asked you and you said, oh, they were just really lovely. And it just made me wonder, well, how did you pull that off? 
having a lovely holiday sister, uh, season with this kind of history, because I know that there are listeners who are really interested in that. Um, good question. Thank you. I, I'm very mindful, and I'm a, long, I'm, a, I'm a lot further along than I was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so I don't have contact with anyone in Australia. I spoke to my, my little sister, Little. She's like 50. I'm 55. So I spoke to my little sister, talked to her a little bit, um, and that was it. Um, my family here, I have a, a good relationship with my younger children. My still Australian for my oldest, but you know that there seems to be a little thawing there, and we'll see how that goes. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm married again uh, to a wonderful lady who, uh, you know, you, Melissa, you, she was all the way through deal with it. She talks about how we face this thing together, right? And uh, and I think it's yeah, she plays a vital role in terms of yeah you know, helping me with it, but I, I think. I've, I've got a piece about who I am and and what my life is, and I, I found that not a lot of people who have been through something like this or extreme trauma have a piece. Uh, they're always striving for what was, be it you know John 1.0 as opposed to John 2.0. I talk about that in the book about the profound change that happens with PTSD or they're, they're hearkening back to what they feel their childhood was like or what others' childhood was like. And I, I, I'm just not that. I, I'm really comfortable with me and my situation. Mm -hmm. You found a way to, to become the John who's supposed to be the John today. Um. No, I, I think I've accepted that I am the John I am today. I, the, with with, with post-traumatic stress, so it's as you know, it's a um, it's a physiological change in a, in a neurological manner, um, and it and it's a real change. It's a real change to how your brain functions. So I went from left brain analytical to right brain creative, which was overnight very goal driven, very focused on different things, to wanting to smoke cigars and write poetry. Um, and I, for a lot of years, fought um, the fact that I didn't like things that I used to like and couldn't do things that I used to do. Um, what was once really easy was no longer easy. And at a point, um, uh, you know, I call it John Ageddon. So after, after John Ageddon, it was like, okay, I have to redefine my normal and I have to come to terms that the John before it will no longer exist. So who is this John? Who is John 2.0? And I have to get to like him. I have to get to like what he likes, excel at what he can excel at. Don't be frustrated because John 2.0 can no longer do what John 1.0 look. And don't harken back and look with fond memories, but yeah, look forward um, towards growing into this version of this person and you know fully embracing and. and fully seeing that um, mature and emerge. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it sounds like you you let yourself kind of grow, which I think is a really, it's actually a really big thing because a lot of times, you know, when we have a big shift in our life, we get very angry and frustrated with ourselves. Like, it's, it's, it, we just are not accepting and yet somewhere along the line, you, you found a way to accept. Now, I, I want to describe something you wrote in the book. Um, you, you wrote about being in a grocery store. Try, this is like that pivotal time when things were really falling apart in your life. You the, write about the, being the in a... Sausage what, incident. <laughs> sorry? The Great Sausage Incident. Yeah, the great sausage incident, exactly. You describe this moment in the grocery store and you're trying to pick out something to eat and you're flooded with all this negative, negative self-talk about which sausage you should pick and you're yelling at yourself because you're emotionally distressed and then you, like, you begin to pray to God. <laughs> Please, God, send me someone I can trust. Like, it seems to yeah. be that in that moment in your life there was an unbelievable lack of compassion already somehow from those in your life. Like somehow, even though you were a married man with a career, children of your own, it 
it did. I was left with the impression reading that that your life lacked a kind of warmth, kindness, and compassion. You got on the phone with your wife and you said you needed something, some help from her in that moment, and she was like, "I need, I need girl time or something like that." She um she decided that because okay with with post traumatic stress, one of the one of the things I know I, I needed was a true north because because I couldn't. Um, I couldn't tell what was real. I couldn't. T- I didn't have people to trust. I I was um, experiencing walking nightmares all the time. I was constantly having uh, flashbacks of uh, sexual abuse, pretty much 24/7. Um, so it was very hard for me to tell what was real and what wasn't. And um, she came to feel that that was needy, and that I just needed to grow and cope with that, and that. Uh, my my need for daily clarification on re- on realities was um, just immature of me. So uh, she just felt that the best way to do that was to deny affirmation. And um, if I tried to ring to get it, find out what was real, and you know, I'm, I'm standing in a in a department store, you know, I think it was a Sprouts or something or Whole Foods and. And I was irrationally overwhelmed with the choice between um, chicken and pork. Yeah. That sounds absolutely asinine, but I was in an absolute panic attack. I was sure that if I made the wrong decision, that it was the end of life as I knew it. I know that sounds stupid. If you haven't been in that place, it could have been Oh, no. It really doesn't (laughs) sound stupid to me. Um, Because, you know, it's kind of like the work I do. I, I, I work with people who are suffering, and... To me, it just sounds like it really had nothing to do with the chicken or the pork or the sausage. There was something profoundly... You were suffering. And, yeah, yeah, you know, the, 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 what really stands out for me is you were suffering, and somehow there was this hollowing out of warmth, kindness, and compassion in your life. It's like, go figure it out yourself. <laughs> like, yeah. this is a time when you need to be able to have warm-hearted connections and that that was not part of your life somehow and it, it no, seemed it wasn't. no and it, it seemed wasn't. like there was going to be this dismantling of everything I, I, I you know it just sounds like your um your opportunity to grow meant that you had to dismantle your life as you knew it from from what I read and you know what I heard you saying on the, those two documentaries I think um, maybe my um, my life dismantled and I had to make the choice to kill myself or grow that was okay. my choice I was okay. told very clearly that um, the best thing I could do for my family at the time was to uh, end it who, who, who no told you that? Ended. Uh, intimate family members at the time. Uh, they said there was no way I could possibly overcome this. People don't get over it. Um, I was never. I, they they thanked me for, you know, apologising for you know, being upset or not coping. But they didn't think that I'd ever get over it. So the best thing I could do for the family was to just um, move on eternally. And uh, so that was one of two times that. Actually, a friend of mine at the time, who's now my wife, Melissa, called me. And, um, you know, she was the answer to that prayer. She was a voice at the end of the phone. And and I said, what should I do? She said, I'll just buy both. And then what went on to talk about the rest of the day and what was happening in the office. And I bought pork and chicken and had them on a barbecue. Life was easy. You know, uh, uh, I'm... I'm really sad for you that you had, you called them intimate family members who told you that the answer was for you to end your life. That is um, shocking and disturbing. I think they were very desperate themselves at the time. And um, I I think that's the nature of post-traumatic stress. Particularly in its early days, well, it can be, it can last for years if someone doesn't come to terms with it. It is very emotionally volatile. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a lot of understanding for it. Um, there is, if, in a sense, if it's tied in with some military service, 
Um, but even if it's extreme sexual abuse or, or other trauma, there's, there's not a lot of understanding to how it affects people. And um, because it's things like you know, things like loss of temper or emotional deregulation, those mm-hmm. things in a normal, you know, parenthesis society, uh, there's certain ways that you're supposed to behave and not. And with post-traumatic stress, you don't behave those ways. You go from zero to 100. And for me, it could be sounds, smells, locations, um, conversations, dreams, panic attacks, and, and all of a sudden, it's there was no fight. I was always fight. I was always in fight mode. Everything because I was, you know, I was a nine-year-old boy protecting himself again, right. protecting himself for the first time. But in a right. you know, now a forty-five or fifty-year-old body, and that comes with a lot of volume and a lot of strength. Right, and you were also uh, I- into fitness, so a lot of volume and a lot of yeah. strength. But it's interesting because, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, that, you know, you have some compassion or sympathy for the people that you were in relationship with because you were a guy with PTSD and you were angry and all these other things. But it seems that, you know, there may have been some things going on with the people around you that, it made it almost impossible for them to stay in a heart-based relationship with you. Uh, and that, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of your selectioning, uh, selection choices before you got married may have come from what you experienced prior to the time that you were married, you know, from what you learned about relationships and connections as a child. I think that's that's accurate. Looking back, I I can see that now. Everybody else around me could see it. I couldn't. Right. Um, you know, I, I you always believe the best in those people around you. They they came to a place where they were very clear that they were regretted um, marrying me and um, um, and said that numerous times. And that was one. That was probably the the straw that that broke the back or enabled me to move on was okay well if, if you regret being married to me that's fine but I'm trying my best and if it's not good enough then I I, I need to move on because I'm not going to get well right it, like it how, how fortunate it is that uh you know they they gave you the gift of that honesty so that you could free yourself from that relationship because it doesn't sound like uh your current marriage is lacking love and compassion no, not at all. No, no. Right. I, I, as I said before, I'm, I'm here today physically because of Melissa. You know. Right, right. And so you you didn't have to be um, in that constant fight or flight um, situation with her because she offered you that soft landing place, that kindness and compassion that I was talking about that seems so missing from your life as you were having that uh, kind of real life change at 45. I have a question from one of our um, listeners uh, for you, Dr. John. Um, uh, this person is asking you what the Give Them a Voice Foundation is. Um, Give Them a Voice started uh, when I realized there was nothing really that was giving a voice to boys that have been sexually abused. Mm-hmm. And then it morphed into two other things. We, we, we work in the area for um, anti human trafficking. Yep. And also for post-traumatic stress recovery. So I think there are a lot of people without a voice um, with PTSD. I think the military, that there's been a lot of awareness in the last decade with the impact of post-traumatic stress um, in mm-hmm. the military. But our military people do not have a voice. Uh, a lot of them don't discuss it. They don't talk about it. And our attempt, uh, our, well, our goal with, with, with uh, give them a voice is to simply be that, to be a voice to those that don't have one or can't use theirs. Mm. Mhm. Wow. That's beautiful. Um if people are interested in emailing us at instudio101 at gmail.com, please do. We want to keep this conversation going forward. Um and I also just want to raise a little bit of awareness of um um hashtag uh one in five. Uh and what hashtag one in five is about is really traumatic stress, isolation, depression, despair, and distress, and the emotional struggles that at least one in five will face in 2019. 
Um, and, you know, we're really raising awareness about the trauma practice for healthy communities because we're really dedicated to helping hashtag one in five. And we need your help as well to meet these goals and make a difference in the community. So if people are interested, they could donate at traumapractice.org. And, you know, one of the big things that we're doing with the trauma practice uh, is um, very much in line with what you're talking about, Dr. K- uh, John, because uh, it's really focused on, you know, bringing people together so they can start having honest and healthy communication, you know, to learn those skills and to learn what it feels like to sit in a room with people who actually want to hear your story and know that what you have to say is important and meaningful. And actually, I think it's part of the evolution of our recovery where we we have an opportunity to, you know, know ourselves and feel that our voice, that we have something to contribute. And I think your story is something really profoundly important to contribute. I've I worked with a lot of um, male survivors of sexual abuse, and just the sh- sense of shame is really very, very acute. Um, so I'm yeah. I'm really grateful that you're you're speaking about this issue. Well, thank you. I, I, I did. I mentioned it in in deal with it. I, actually, in the first book, uh, no working title, I said that uh, for better or worse, you can sit around and have a conversation with people about the sexual abuse of women and girls and its impact, um, but you cannot have that conversation about boys and men, particularly mm-hmm. if the abuser um, is a mother. Or if, no one wants to talk about it. They, they'll shut the conversation down. They'll deny it. Mothers don't do those sorts of things to boys. Whereas we know from our human trafficking that 45% of perpetrators are female yeah. and over 50% of the victims are male. Yeah. But they're, 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 they're not reflected in... There's not honest stats on that yet. Everything we've got on the ground says there are. You get outside of the um, Americas, and uh, particularly out of North America, and every other nation, the statistics of boys... And men being trafficked humanly and sexually even is is on par with women. Um, when it comes to human trafficking for labor or other things, the percentage of men and boys is higher. And yet people aren't talking about it. And if we're not prepared to talk about it, then we cannot get well. Yeah. And the best thing I believe you can do to help women and girls um, from being sexually abused is talk to the boys and the men who have been abused and let's have a conversation and work together. It's a, it's not a gender issue for me. It's a human rights issue. Mhm, mhm. That's that's absolutely. I I, I buy that too. Um, and we've got another um, email um, from a listener who says that uh, well, she loves your uh, your accent. It's Australian, <laughs> right? There you go. What part yes, of Australia is. are you from? Um, I was originally from. Um, Sydney. Okay, uh, great. I'm in the bush, um, uh, working sheep and cattle ranches, and my first degree is in agriculture. Wow. Um, and also, where are your books um, available so that um, listeners can find them? You can get them on Amazon, or if you go to our, uh, we actually made a code up for today for your audio listeners. Okay. Um, if they go to our website, um, drjohnaking.com. And at checkout, use the code S2S. Uh, that stands for from stress to strength. S2S. Then that'll give them a twenty percent discount. Nice. Okay. So let's repeat that um, website again. DrJohnAKing.com. So www.drjohnAKing.com. Perfect. Okay, and it's S2S, and you get a. 20% discount. 20% discount. Yes, discount. Beautiful. Okay, so hopefully this will help um, some of our listeners. And um, and the next uh, email, I'm, I'm so saddened as to what Dr. King has been through in his life. That has to be the most horrific life event that anyone could go through. Uh, well, uh, and just, just to the listener that just, um, sorry, the, the listener that sent this in, I don't think it was one event. I think this was going on for you for years, right? Yeah, it was going on for 14 years. 14 years. Yeah, from the age what? of four uh, to 16. So, so our listener would like to know how do you cope with such injustice throughout your adult life? 
such injustice. Yeah. Did they say? Yeah, that's what um, the question is. How do you cope with such an injustice? Oh, you just move on. So I, I, what can I do? Like, I, I've never... I can take... There's not a statute of limitations in Australia. I can go back to court. Um, I can take them to court. Um, but, but then I'm male, so men don't get abused. Um, a female did it, therefore women don't do this sort of things. I know they're very broad statements, but this is how the justice system is. So I've got post-traumatic stress. The job of the um, prosecution would be to trigger me. And I would probably spend five to seven years reliving um, the worst years of my life. And they'll be, I, I'm, I'm smart enough to understand the role of memory, the deterioration of memory, that it's not a digital, it's, it's analog, not digital, um, that things change over time. And, and also the nature of the brain is once you process things and deal with things, your brain wants to move on to fresh memories. You have to really actively drag up the past with the brain. Mm -hmm. So my choice was I can go back, be put into a horrendous situation and probably spend five to seven years reliving this crap or I can spend five to seven years trying to live forward. And, you know, what am I going to get from these people? If, if they were prepared to apologize to me and take responsibility, then that's probably all I'd ever want. But they were never prepared to do that when I confronted them eventually. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to do it in court. They're going to have to um, defend their integrity, defend their reputation, which mm -hmm. means they have to call me a liar. And mm -hmm. I just couldn't be bothered. I'd and instead, you, you, you wrote the truth and you spoke the truth, which is like a real power position. Yeah, it's like I'm not, I don't have to justify myself to them. Beautiful. You know, I, I've got all the, you know, yeah. Beautiful. Uh, I'm I, I'm really I'm so happy to speak with you, and uh, we have a bunch of more emails, so I want to get through those as well. Um, this one is um, I'm so sad that a family would stake as someone to kill themselves. Yeah, I, I was really horrified by that as well. Um, Dr. King is such an inspiration to us who are suffering these mental injustices in our life. Thank you for the uplifting thoughts, advice and faith to help us get through or at least cope with our demons. You know what? I have to say the one thing that I really think is true is that people don't want to be alone. Like, we want to know that, you know, whatever it was that, that happened in our lives, that we're not standing here alone. You know, that sense of isolation brings enormous guilt and shame. So I, I'm also really grateful that you're speaking, Dr. John, and, you know, I just want to really... You know, thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Sir. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, here's another. Um, this is from a for a new a new listener um, saying that she loves the show. It's the first time listening. Found it through Instagram. Oh, I didn't know I was on Instagram. <laughs> How do you get a copy of Dr. John's book? I think we covered that. So if you go to drjohnaking.com, um, you'll get 20% off with the S2S -S code. And that's very generous and perfect. Um, Dr. John okay. King, can you tell us about Casino Night? Oh, Casino Night. So we had these folks approach us, and they want to help us raise some money for the year. Our, our aim is to give away 10,000 copies of the books, of the book in um, 2019. We, every week, and I, I, could, I could read them to you now, every week we get emails from um, veterans predominantly at the moment saying, uh, thank you, you saved my life. Uh, thank you, I've had two or three suicide attempts, but I found your book and I'll never do it again. Or we had one guy in a VA clinic and it, this stuff. Uh, it's pretty emotional. It's like he uh, um, he went home from a clinic with our book and uh, with my book and just slept with it for a couple of days because it it gave him hope where he'd never had hope. And um, mm -hmm. we, we, we're talking about some of the toughest men that you can you'll ever come across. Mm -hmm. And every one of these men has been horrendously sexually abused, and they end up going into the elite special forces because they. That they say they will never be hurt and those that they love will never be hurt again. And they go in there and they, they put themselves in harm's way and they come back, they they can't 
they don't have a place for someone to discuss this with. So it's locked down and they come back, they're diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, they're given 15 or 20 medications and no one ever talks to them about their childhood. Right. There is a correlation between um, post-traumatic stress. It's like a Venn diagram, you know, heavy metals, uh, low, low endocrine system dropping after 25 in men, um, you know, testosterone, adrenal fatigue from exposure in a battle situation post-traumatic stress, childhood sexual abuse, and as I said, heavy metals. There's a, there's a perfect storm that happens um, right in the middle of that. And that's what we're finding with a lot of these people. And you, you cannot deal with post-traumatic stress disorder as a single, um, it, it's a body, mind, spirit thing. If, you, if you're not prepared to look at the entire body as a complete system and address it, um, you'll never get well. Some of the biggest leaps forward I've found in my own life has been dealing with things. I know this will sound weird, and everyone's going to think I'm some sort of weird yogi tree hugger, and I know it probably upsets <laughs> some, but whatever. But, you know, I got, I'm wearing shorts, not yoga pants. Put it that way. It's like I, I can't have orange number five. I, I can't have certain food colorings. I can't have sugars because the anxiety and depression that kicks in um, is, is horrendous. But until I started to deal with my diet, along with my physical activity, the level of testosterone in my body, did, did I start to get completely whole? Um, and if you deal with this thing on a prescription med situation, you're never going to get there, you know? You yep. end up, you know... I, I absolutely agree. Well. Yeah, I think I think we really are. We're biopsychosocial beings. We're physical beings, and we can't separate one thing from another in order for us to be well. We have to treat ourselves as a whole and lean towards the uh, recognition that we have to nourish all aspects of our being and our bodies, and our minds. And our spiritual lives as well, in order to be well. Yeah. And you know, kind of pay attention. You you had said, you know, you know, like if you if you if you drink like something orange or you eat something with orange in it, that you just feel like really un unwell, or at least you might have felt unwell at a certain point. And it's like the fact that you listen to that, regardless of what um, you know label you give it, you know, a tree hugger or yoga being or whatever, you know, the fact that you listen to it is, um, you know, probably one of the most important pieces. Because, I, I mean, I really like the idea of leaning towards the places where we can feel our pain and being as accepting as we possibly can, because then we get our own source code for our healing. Then we learn Absolutely. ways to actually know what it is like to be one with ourselves. And it creates a certain kind of peacefulness. Like, yeah, it might not be perfect, but this is as it is. And when there's space for it, it just creates an enormous possibility for growth and healing. You know, pay attention, you know. Yeah, um, you've got to do that. Yeah. yeah well, I write in the book, I write in deal with it. I talk about the time that I nearly killed Melissa Saley, uh, um, which is un un <laughs> Anyway, another thing I did was I was out riding one day. I was doing about 22 miles an hour on my bicycle, and I came off, um, and I, I, I really injured myself badly. Now, to your point about moving towards the pain, so I've got a problem in my right shoulder, and I've noticed that my, my entire – I can move my right arm and do everything with it, but I do it in a funny way to avoid the point of pain. It's not until I start to push my arm through the pain does my arm come fully back into function and rehab. And it's just, as you're saying, Doc, it's the same with us emotionally. We avoid it because we're humans. We avoid things that are painful. Instead of embracing those things that are painful and understand that we will grow through it. You know, people ask me what my doctor is in, and I tell them it's turning shit into fertilizer. <laughs> um, and that, because it really has been. Um, it's, I've never shied away from those things. I don't know if I should say shit on the channel. Sorry about that. Oh, um, you but, know what? I think if there's a problem, Gary will let us know. <laughs> okay, thanks, Gary. Sorry, mate. There's, there's no problem. It's internet radio, so there's no problem whatsoever. <laughs> thank thank hey, you, Gary. I'll get, I'll get some beer. I'll get some beer and we'll slow down one. Good. Okay, well, apparently you can say these things on internet radio, so that's not 
not a problem at all. I'm very glad to say that. Here's another email. Um, it was so shocking to hear that almost 50% of child abuse is done by women to little boys. Who would know this? Very little news about this in the public dona- domain. Is this some kind of type of cover-up? Oh, wow. It, well, you know, that's a big, that's a big conversation. Um, yeah, about that is a big conversation. Men and, and it's, it, it's one that I've, I've had to face for many years. And I talk about this again in the, in the book. I talk about how um, my mother got some of her friends from her university. I was 11. And um, I had to stand there and I had to justify my existence as a man and what men actually bring into the world. They were all part of feminist studies at Macquarie University. And I had to sit there and, and give a dissertation on the value of men. And I was 11 and why I should be able And the, the head professor, her res- resolution was that, you know, uh, and I can't say those words. <laughs> but just say, look, she was just going to turn me into a girl because that would be the best use for me. Um, and so my experience has been that there is a group of our society that, that really don't like men for some reason. And I understand they've been wounded and hurt. And I've got, a, I've got one chapter in my, um, my book um, where the chapter is, all women are manipulative, lying bitches, and I hate them. And the very first line after that is... Um, this statement is absolutely false. I don't. It's just that I see a whole lot of people that have been hurt by someone else, and that's their stance. I, I, I don't know every woman in the world, so I can't make that statement truthfully. And I have my wife and I have other women in my life that are wonderful, so they're not lying, manipulative bitches, so therefore the statement's not true. Yet I read these memes and this, this vitriol that, that happens that all men are bastards, all men are narcissists. And it's like, look, I get, you, I get it that you've been hurt, but don't raise your kids in a household like that because all you're doing is perpetuating the narrative. And, mm-hmm. and the, the other thing I see is that, that some ladies are really comfortable as mothers of sons saying those things, and they feel that somehow it's not going to seep through into their treatment of their sons. Mm-hmm. And um, if you want to a strained young man, if you want to give them a wrong view of women is grow them up in that environment. Uh, you know, with the trafficking thing, one thing that we're very strong on is encouraging. As, as a dad, I've always prepared um, my girls for a hurtful world out there. But with my background, I've also hurt, prepared my son for a hurtful world out there, for men and women that could hurt him. And, and if you're a mother of sons and you're not preparing your boys like you've prepared your girls, then you're a miss. Mm-hmm. And we've got to we've got to help our kids and prepare them. This is a different generation. You said something very powerful uh, at the at the. Well, I think we were just talking ourselves about how this generation wants to engage in conversations about emotional toxicity because we're at a stage, particularly in the West, where we are affluent enough and we have the time enough to to think about things about moving our entire planet and race forward. And I think these are some of the things that we have to be prepared to have conversations about. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, we live in a very materialistic, deterministic world where we believe that that's the whole uh, thing. You know, it's like just acquire more stuff and you'll be okay. And it's like, it just is, there's so much emptiness and nothing in it. Like, I mean, we could, we could become, you know, super knowledgeable about certain topics and absolutely know nothing whatsoever about, you know, the meaning of who we are and what we're doing on this planet. And, you know, we need to kind of come, come whole as human beings because there's no way we could have this epidemic of human trafficking as it is today. And people who haven't had a chance to uh, watch the documentary Stopping Traffic, it's, 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 heart-wrenching it's riveting but it speaks to me so much about you know we as a species are so damaged that there can be a 25 something like that 25 billion dollar um industry i shouldn't call it an industry it's not really an industry it's a devastation of human trafficking it's 150 billion. billion dollar. Yeah, well, that's that's more than what uh, Donald Trump needs to build his uh, his wall. <laughs> I'd rather it go into the wall than into this. <laughs> but you yeah. know, a lot of those things. Look, I've got 
I've got a pretty big presence on Instagram. It's uh, Dr. John A. King is my Instagram handle. And I post a lot of stuff, not only the post-traumatic stress stuff, but a lot of the stuff about what's really happening in um, human trafficking and sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, so but there's some great resources. You know, we've given our life to this. Um, every penny's gone into it. Uh, you know, you'd mentioned the casino night, but their aim there is to try and help us raise the money for the first stage of giving away these these 10,000 books. We, we and we want to start a study because I look. I know it sounds grandiose, but I've I've got a real handle after talking to some doctors and researchers on how we can stop this one in 22 veteran suicide rate. Mm-hmm. And it's not only it's not only that, but it's the it's the rate of suicide across the board which is on the increase. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we, I think there's different ways that we can address it. And so what they're trying to do with the casino night is just get us some seed funding so we can start. You know, get, we just gave 70 books away uh, last week. Mm-hmm. Um, one to a VA clinic up in um, Pennsylvania, I think it was, and one to a uh, PTSD uh, equine therapy center down in Florida. Yeah, well, it's obviously it's hitting the right. Mark, and I think I think one of the things that you're doing is you're speaking very honestly. And you know, there's nothing as refreshing as somebody who could just speak very honestly. I mean, I, I think people are very tired of the, I guess, you know, the make believe. It doesn't nourish. I want to ask you one more question about something in your book because we've got about five minutes left and I definitely want to cover this because it's so interesting. So you went through an experience where a doctor did a, a brain scan and I think you were in an fMRI and, um, you know, you learned that your scan looked functionally different than a typical brain scan and you felt tremendous relief i want to see if you could explain that relief oh uh well okay so i understand that up to this point i'd been told that all of this was in my head which it which it is because <laughs> it's a mental bloody illness love you know i'm crazy <laughs> it's all in my head and um but i've been told i was making it up that i was a faker um, that these fears were irrational, that couldn't be happening, and all this sort of stuff. And um, so even though every day I'm struggling, I'm battling, I'm trying, there's this voice in my head, it's actually outside saying, you're a liar, you're making it up, this can't be real, just grow up, man up, get over it. And then I went and had this brain scan, and I've got the pictures from the actual brain scan in the book. Um, my frontal lobe, the front third of my brain is completely shut down. Um, the left side of my brain is, is all but completely shut down. You see the red spots where the, the Agmandala and, and hippocampus mm-hmm. are working overtime um, to try and compensate and how the brain is literally rewired. And the doctor said to me, he pulled me out of this, out of this it was a group meeting we were in, and I explained how I got in that in the book. And, and he asked me, he said, well, where did you serve in the military? I said, well, sir, I've never served in the military. He goes, no, that can't be true. Uh, this is, he said, we, we do these scare scans on um, veterans every day, and this is the worst case of post-traumatic stress I've ever seen. He said, well, did, what um, professional sports did you play? And I said, well, sir, sir, don't I? He said, no, no, that can't be true. This is some of the worst cases of TBI that we've got indicators for. I said, no, I was, I was sexually abused. And it was the first time that they'd had a non-combatant, non-professional sports, and I've played a lot of high-level sports, but not professional, um, person that they scanned from childhood sexual abuse. So it was the first time that they were able to um, quantifiably point and say that is the impact of childhood sexual abuse on the brain. And for me, it was literally like, I'm not making this shit up. Yeah. Look, I've got pictures. And and it was the greatest sense of, of just relief. It gave me freedom to go, okay, I can move forward because I know... I'm an old boxer, so now I had an enemy. I had someone in the ring with me that I could now fight. Mm, yeah. I had pictures. I knew what they looked like. I never knew I was ghost boxing up to then, but now I knew what this bad boy looked like. <laughs> That's I, really. I talk about that a lot, a lot in the book. I did some. I do a couple. I do a whole bunch of one-minute videos for people. I post two or three a week on my Instagram page and on Facebook, etc. 
And I deal with some of these things are like, well, how do you tell and how can you cope and what are the tools that you can do um, to live better, you know? And, and all of those come out of the, the Deal With It book. Mm-hmm. That's really a, a beautiful place to end, and I, I'm really grateful that you took the time to speak to us today and um, share your your perspective. And I think, really, you said it so well. It, this is real. So if you are, you know, experiencing post-traumatic stress, it's real. And it shows up in brain scans, and it's not something you're making up. And it's absolutely essential that you find ways yep. that will make a difference. And, you know, that's going to be unique for every person. You know, if you need to see a therapist, yes. find one. But, you know, also recognize that part of your recovery is really learning how to listen to yourself and, you know, kind of bear witness, lean towards the place that you can feel your pain so you can better understand what it is you need to do to heal you, you are a unique human being, so don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Dr. Uh, John King, and you have um, your website, drjohnaking.com, for people who want a copy of the book, S2S, 20% off. Um, it has been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to speak with you. Um, Thanks, any. Anna. Anything else that you you want to end with? Um, look, if your if your people order the book today, I'll personally sign it for them and, and, and send it out to them this week uh, as a way to say thank you to you um, for your work and your network and you and Gavin and the team up there and what you're doing to have honest conversations. It's been not, I've talked to some crazy people though, and you're nice, so <laughs> right. I'll come back and, I'll come back and talk to you again. Some of those other ones they're idiots. Yeah, let's let's do that in 2019. I would be really, really yeah. delighted to, to hear more about what you're doing. And I have so many other questions I want to ask you. I'm so sorry we didn't get through to them because, um, you know, I think you have something very important to share. Well, thanks. Hey, look, if you send me the link, I'll, um, I've got about 4 million people across different networks, for the, and, I, and I'd like to push the radio show out and um, help the conversation get forward. So, well, we love yeah. to do that. All right, love. Hey, thanks, and thanks to Gavin for not pushing the red button on me too much. <laughs> no problem there. Not at all. No problem. All right. I'll get, I'll, hey, I'll, if you want to, I'll get Mel to come in on the next um, phone conversation we have. Oh, that would be great. I'd love to speak with her as well. I think we are wrapping up, Gary. Are we not? We are wrapping up. Okay. Thank you so much right. again for hosting us. Thanks, Gary. You're welcome. God bless you. Take care. He does. Cheers, Mike. Okay. And thank you, Dr. Anna. Thank you. And we'll we'll talk to you soon. And we hope that uh, everybody, I'm sure your listeners, we wish a very, very happy new year and uh, to good health and good mental health as well. Have a great 2019, everyone. And you too, Gary. And take care of that cough of yours. I will. Thank you, Dr. Anna. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You have been listening to The Beer Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, right here on Reality Radio 101.